Hello fellow Goodies fan, it's Jeffers here from the Goodies Podcast with another re-released interview, uh, previously only available on the Goodies Podcast, and this one's from, ooh, nearly 10 years ago now, it's from January 2011, with Graham Garden, the Goody himself. This was recorded just a couple of months after the 40th anniversary of the Goodies, and we thought we'd re-release it in the lead-up to the 50th anniversary of the Goodies. Anyway, I'll get out of here and leave you to enjoy the interview. Cheers. <laughs> Hello, Graham. This is Jeff and Jane from the Goodies Podcast. How are you? I'm well, thanks. How are you guys? Excellent. Even more excellent for speaking to you. Oh, that's very kind of you. Um, So I guess the first question we have is, what type of expectations did you have for 2010 and the 40th anniversary of the Goodies? And now that the year's over, how did you find it? Um, Expectations. I suppose... um, it wasn't until I was made aware of it on the sort of websites and things that I realised it was the 40th anniversary. <laughs> um, so once I found that out from you guys, um, I didn't expect all that much to happen, to be honest. Um, we discovered that uh, Ardman and Slapstick Animation were giving us a uh, slapstick um, festival in Bristol, were giving us uh, an award for uh, for visual comedy, which was very nice. Mm-hmm. Um and they timed that to coincide with the 40th. Yeah. Uh, and we'd hoped that the um, that network would be able to bring out a DVD at the same time and sort of combine the launch of the DVD with the, the award thing. Oh, yeah. But um, as it happened, the BBC were being a little bit obstructive. No. Um, about, the B- about the DVD material. And so, um, in a, an odd sort of string of events... Uh, the head of uh, BBC Worldwide, called John Smith, uh, was made aware of um, the petition, which you guys did. Oh, yeah. He hadn't been aware of. And also the fact that his own uh, BBC were being a bit obstructive about getting the DVD out. And uh, when he did find out, that same afternoon, suddenly I heard from Network that the BBC were on again. Oh, he excellent. could uh, bring out the DVD. So I thought that would probably be it. Um but as we went around uh, promoting the DVD, we had <laughs> that uh, question to points of view on the BBC from uh, Richard Sleeman. Oh, yeah. Um, I think, saying, uh, you know, what are the BBC's plans? And a very sniffy reply came out. <laughs> and so while we were promoting the DVD, a lot of people were saying, you know, uh, you know what about this uh, thing on points of view? And that got a lot of publicity, uh, good publicity for us. And the BBC suddenly announced that they're going to put out all those shows over Christmas. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so that was a big surprise to us. That's excellent. And that leads nicely into the next question. Uh, the repeats on BBC, what are your thoughts on those? Um, I, I suppose if we're going to be sort of, you know, nitpicky about it, we would like to have been consulted. And somebody said, you know, which ones do you want to go out? Oh, you weren't <laughs> consulted it... at all? No, no, no. Oh, wow. Um, and uh, so we didn't know until, well, until the evening, because they changed the titles on almost all of them. They put one title out in the uh, Radio Times and something else would go on the TV. Oh, wow. And they went out at different times of night and everything. But um, that being said, they actually did choose quite good ones. <laughs> nice ones off the, uh, the DVDs and some ones that uh, people hadn't seen for a long time, which was great. Yeah. So, uh, so that was very nice to have those going out. Um, in an ideal world, I suppose it would have been nice to put them out while people were watching. <laughs> <laughs> um, but despite the times, they got healthy ratings. Uh, yes, I don't know what a healthy rating is for midnight, but I guess between half a million and three quarters of a million people watching at that time of night is, is pretty good. Oh, well, that's and, excellent. Um, and about another 10% or so uh, were recording it as well. So, yeah. So I think, yes, they were probably quite healthy figures. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, um, it was a little bit uh, unexpected that they weren't available on iPlayer afterwards. Well, I mean, if you want to go in, <laughs> into conspiracy theories... <laughs> oh, please do! <laughs> BBC had somehow been forced into showing them. So they tried to scupper it by changing the titles. Nobody knew what would be on when. Uh, then they switched the times around. <laughs> uh, so uh, they went 
at at different times of night. And then they show them at different times in Scotland to the rest of uh, the United Kingdom. Oh. So, th so the figures didn't count because the Scottish figures didn't add up. Um, and, um, and then they weren't available on iPlayer. Now, you might say, all oh, that sort of enemy action, but I don't think it is. I think there probably was some contractual copyright reason over the music or something that they couldn't put it onto iPlayer for World. Oh. oh because you know when it's an eye player it kind of is uh, published all over um so yeah I, I think that's a shame but it'd be interesting to see if they follow it up with anything it would be lovely if they did yeah good yeah that would be nice and um and i hope it's helped the dvd sales as well because that will always you know that's a nice boost and we'll hopefully bring out some more dvds oh fingers crossed yeah that would be great uh, well, moving on to other products, you know, your books, uh, well, there's The Seventh Man, for example, and The Skylighters and The Book of Medical Humour. These are all quite different, you know, a diverse selection of styles. So what type yeah. of writing do you prefer, and are there more books on the horizon? Um, I don't know, but if there's any type I prefer, I suppose if I preferred any one of those styles of writing, I'd have done more of it. Um, <laughs> I've only done sort of one of each, really. Um, I don't know. I love writing sort of dialogue and writing radio. I think is the, is the thing I like best. Writing television is good fun too, but radio is um, I just find more m amusing and uh, not necessarily easier, but uh, but um, um, more satisfying in a way because you've got to create the pictures. You don't rely on somebody else to do anything. You just have to do it with the words and sound effects, and that's great. Mm -hmm. Um, so um, that's probably the, the kind of writing I like best. I sort of don't do an awful lot now because uh, I'm semi-retired, I suppose. Um, not entirely by my own choice. <laughs> but uh, we're still doing radio shows and, uh, in fact, you know, developing new ones like The, Un uh, the Unbelievable Truth. Um, so that, that's, um, that keeps us pretty busy at the moment. And uh, that's kind of the way I like it, really. So, you know, I do a lot of sit-down comedy, really. With the unbelievable truth, do the comedians write the pieces that they read, or does someone who like provides David Mitchell's script write them? Um, if they don't write them themselves, I write them. Um, but on the whole, we like them to to write them themselves. Occasionally, um, for example, on the Edinburgh shows, they were all up there doing their own stand-up shows. Yeah. So when we recorded the shows in Edinburgh. Um, Nobody up there really had time to write their own lecture, but I wrote some for them, and uh, what happens is we send the ones I've written to them, and they make it their own. You know, they change the phrasing, and they uh, yeah. in their own gags or whatever. I did love um, Adam Hill's Kangaroo. So sometimes I'll write a sort of structural essay for them, and <laughs> they, oh, yeah. they can enlarge on that. But on the whole, yeah, they, they do write their own. Oh, okay. But we have to go through them quite carefully, because very often they put in an, uh, 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 an un suspected truth that uh, they happen to say something you know they might start off by saying you know edinburgh is the capital of scotland and uh, it is and somebody might interrupt and say, that's true that's generally yeah. you that interrupts though <laughs> 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 yeah. graham Sorry. buzzes yeah. i think that's true that's right yeah <laughs> Good move. So how much writing and performing is lined up for you so far this year? I mean, what can we look forward to? Um, not a lot lined up, but then uh, you know, there never is. I mean, things just sort of uh, come up out of the blue. I know what we will be doing is uh, we've just finished um, last night recording the last two shows of the current I'm Sorry I Haven't a Clue series mm -hmm. uh, down in Chatham. And the lovely people of Chatham were a smashing audience, and um, I'd like to thank them if any of them are listening to the podcast. It was a great time. We really enjoyed it. Um, and um, so that's, that uh, series uh, polished off. It's going out at the moment. We'll do another series a bit later in the year, and then another one in the sort of autumn-winter time as well. Uh, then we're going to hopefully take the show on tour. We do a theatrical version of I'm Sorry I Happened to Clue which uh, is just a stage show. It's not recorded. But we've done that for a few years, and that's great fun. So uh, I'm hoping we'll do that for a, a couple of weeks or so. 
Um, otherwise, there's The Unbelievable Truth, a couple of series of that coming up. And um, that sounds quite a lot, actually, doesn't it? It does. Uh, <laughs> and anything else that comes my way. There is a publisher who wants me to write some sort of memoir. Not really an autobiography, but just sort of things that have happened and stories I remember or that, whatever. Um, and I guess at some point I'll probably sit down and start to, trying to, to knock that out. You're so casual about it. Yes, you know, someone's asked me to write a memoir. I'll just, you know, sit down eventually and knock that out. And, you know, we're here thinking, oh, oh, a Graham Garden memoir. Oh, oh, can't wait. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I sound too laid back about it. No, no, it's great. It's but, just... um, no, I mean, it, it's not something that, that's um, sort of terribly exciting for me to go and, and, and jump into. It's a sort of... Uh, a sort of nice thing to do in a sort of uh, a few afternoons. It'll be it'll be lovely to start with because I'll just sort of do it, you know, when I feel like it and blah de blah. And the publisher might then say, "Oh yeah, that that's good. That'll make a book." And then he'll give me a deadline, and then it becomes very serious. And that really start. Then you start fretting yeah. and taking it seriously. And I shan't be laid back then. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Graham, so before I move on to the next question, I just wanted to ask, going back to the unbelievable truth, when you're doing your appearances on there, yeah. is that, um, you know, you lay things out at the beginning of the series in the planning stage, and uh, do you say, right, well, I'll go in for a couple of episodes, or, you know, how do you schedule your own appearances on there? Um, well, John Laysmith really does the booking on it, and... Um... He usually likes to include me on one of the uh, one of the shows or one of the pairs of uh, shows that we do. Um, and it's a question of when I'm available or if there's a particular week he would like some particular balance in the show, you know, that uh, there might be a couple of newcomers and he'd like somebody a bit more experienced in there as well. Mm -hmm. um, but there's no great sort of... Um, um, sort of master plan for, for plotting out the series. It's done... Uh, kind of show by show and he you know obviously tries to get a good balance in each program and uh, whenever possible to feature people who are, are a bit new who've not you know, not been on Radio 4 certainly and not a sort of familiar Radio 4 voice uh, which is why we don't use all the clue people all that much ah that um, makes sense yeah uh, because you know we there's enough trouble getting Jeremy Hardy on our show because he does another show called The News Quiz and uh, BBC don't like him doing two shows, you know, along the same lines, which is silly. But uh, uh, there it is. But it means that we can get people like Henning Vane, who's, you know, when I, uh, not done radio before, I don't think, and is absolutely brilliant. Oh, he's great. Yeah. Half a lot. I like the way he throws in the little bits about the war, like third time lucky yeah. and that sort of thing. <laughs> It was very, very funny. Yeah. Yeah. The unbelievable truth was created by Jesus. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's the one. Yeah. Ooh. Uh, and how did you settle on David Mitchell as the chairman? He's, um, he's our, I mean, I think he was our only choice, really, and we, he sort of said yes when we offered it. Otherwise, uh, we'd have been a bit scuppered because I just think he's, he's the ideal person for it. He's... You know, he's very bright and he's pretty well educated. He knows a lot of stuff, um, but also is very sharp and, and uh, he will sort of launch into a rant about, <laughs> you know, how unfair the marking system is or something. Um, <laughs> and fruit, uh, and, being in a fruit And salad. he's great. Uh, he, he's really smashing. But um, I, uh, I, I think, you know, we just sort of sat down and said, who's the ideal person to do it? Oh, the trouble is that David is doing two other shows, or has been doing two other shows based on truth and lies. One of them called Would I Lie to You, and the other one called The Bubble. Okay. And um, they're on television. Ah. Uh... We, we, we don't think we could really put the unbelievable truth on, on TV in the UK, anyway. I was um, wondering if it was ever going to you know, David go is television. already involved in that sort of uh, couple of shows, which would be in direct competition, if not directly compared to each other. Yeah. Right. right. Mm. Um, now, the only time you appeared on QI, Alan Davis wasn't there. Uh, but no, he wasn't. <laughs> uh, yeah, I believe there was a Arsenal game on. <laughs> yes, that's right, there was. Uh -huh. uh, outrageous, I thought. <laughs> 
Um, Graceful behaviour. <laughs> During one of his podcasts last year, he he called you the nicest man in the world. Uh, so we assumed that due to that, you've never been asked to appear on Grumpy Old Men. And Tim turned down Strictly Come Dancing uh, a couple of times. So I was just wondering what offers have come your way that you've declined. Um, well, it was very sweet of Alan to say that. I mean, that helped. I think he was only saying that to make his story about him not turning up on that recording <laughs> first. But, uh, yeah, he, he, we worked together on a show called About a Dog, which I wrote, and he played the dog. Oh. In. Uh, so we do have been working together a bit. Um, what have I been offered and turned down? Um, well, lots of things that you probably wouldn't have heard of, because I hadn't heard of them, which is maybe what <laughs> turned down. Um, Celebrity wife swap was one. Oh my lord! <laughs> I could think of nothing worse. No, I agree. Imagine. Do you know who the other celebrity was they were proposing to swap? <laughs> no, but I could guess the sort of people they would have. <laughs> um, They'll send you Sarah that, Palin over or someone like that. Yeah, that that just sort of filled me with horror. Um, there's another one. What was it? Um, Oh, one of those where they come and look around your house and uh, it wasn't actually cash in the attic, but it was something similar to that where they they come and snoop around your house for some reason. Um, didn't care for that either. Um, no, but I've not been approached for Strictly Come Dancing or Dancing on Ice or any of these other things, I'm happy to say. And I, I, I wouldn't do them. Um, uh, no grumpy old men. Uh, hey, grumpy old man. No, I think people assume I'm 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 not grumpy enough. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm too laid back. That's a problem. No, it's never a problem to be too laid back. Do you think I should get grumpier? No, 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 no. Nice people. Oh, that's right. what we want. Nice people. Nice. Um, all right. So to flip the last question around, we know you know the unbelievable truth has has been a success. But what ideas for TV and radio that you've devised? haven't made it well quite a lot to be honest because um john naismith who produces i'm sorry i haven't a clue and i have this uh, production company called random productions uh who do uh the unbelievable truth and the i'm sorry i haven't a clue stage shows and we do uh, we've done other uh, little programs as well but every year uh the BBC asked people to submit ideas, uh, I think twice a year, and um, every year we put in two or three ideas, and most of them are rejected, so there's loads of stuff that we've had turned down, some of which we are very fond of, like there was one which was sort of slightly a send-up of the, the Apprentice or the sort of troubleshooter thing where this mad businessman goes into... Uh, places like schools and uh, tries to make them run on business lines and totally destroys them. <laughs> um, so there's things like that, a couple of uh, quiz-based sort of programs too. Um, and some sort of, sort of educational comedy things we've, we've, we've thought of as well. I mean, I can't remember all the details of all of them because, uh, as I say, there are so many that we've submitted and occasionally little, uh, you know, sitcoms and things like that. But the BBC are, are very good at finding reasons not to do things. So um, we haven't uh, had a great strike right there. But what we've got through, like the unbelievable truth, has been very successful. So when you, you know, these shows go through, you can pick people like David Mitchell. So I'm just wondering, mm. um, yeah, who who do you think is the top comic talent to emerge in the last decade, say, in the UK? And could you name one female and one male? Well, I could name lots. Um, there are so many that have been... I can't remember how long a lot of people have been around. You know, we're working with Jack D at the moment, who's very funny. Ross Noble is terrific. Uh, Peter Kay is very funny. Michael McIntyre is very unpopular with all of the other comedians, but loved by the audiences. And I think that's why he's unpopular with the other comedians. <laughs> Um, there were lots of uh, lots of ladies have been around too, like Joe Brand and uh, the wonderful Linda Smith, who who died a, a few years ago. She used to appear on Clue with us. She was superb. And and the younger ones coming through, like Shapi Kosandi, who's uh, Iranian. Um, 
and they're fantastic. It's um, uh, I mean the, the the space of comedy I think at the moment is extremely healthy. Um, Lee Mack is a very funny guy. He's got a sitcom at the moment as well as being a stand-up, and that makes me laugh a lot. There are lots of very good comedy actors and uh, actresses, and um, and also the stand-up. So uh, I think people say, you know, they oh, it's not as good as it used to be. I think it's it's much better than it used to be, and there's more of it, and there are more people around doing it, and there are more people to be discovered. So um, I feel it's very healthy. Would Would you say that it's more a sort of intellectual comedy now rather than sort of boob and bum jokes? Um, I think there's still quite a lot of boob and bum jokes. <laughs> I think what gets on TV, perhaps, is more intellectual comedy or some more polite comedy. But, um, no, I think there's, there's a lot of sort of pretty basic comedy around still. There's not a lot of visual comedy uh, so much, except for some kids' programs. But um, I think, you know, we couldn't do a show like The Goodies anymore because of uh, health and safety. They'd stop us doing it. Oh, OK. Yeah, that makes sense. Health and safety is a bit of a... Um, a concern everywhere. A bugbear for yeah, people yeah. to deal with. Um, so if you were casting the role of Graham in a remake of The Goodies, who do you think could handle the role? I think the person I would ask to play me would be Mark Gattis. Do you know him? Well, uh, he wrote for so. Doctor Who. Yeah. and uh, uh, That's well, right. And The uh, League of Gentlemen. And um, he's appeared in loads of stuff. Um I think I'd like to ask him to play it because uh, when um, years ago we did a, a, an appearance at the National Film Theatre and uh, he and some of his chums from League of Gentlemen came along to it and they bought books and had, brought them along for us to sign, which was very sweet. And he said, I always wanted to be you at school because you're a bit mad. <laughs> <laughs> so I think he's halfway there already. <laughs> He'd be my choice. I can see him being on a, a pirate radio ship. So if he wasn't available, Matt Damon would have to do. Matt Damon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that he would jump at the chance. <laughs> um, will there ever be a future series of Hamish and Dougal? Uh, that's a, a, a great shame that uh, I don't think there will. Um, but you never know. Don't, never say never. We'd love to do it. Uh, Barry and I have a great time doing it. Um, the the show used to go out at quarter as a quarter of an hour show, uh, which went out in the middle of the night, at eleven o'clock, eleven fifteen, or something. Mm -hmm. And um, so the audience was not very big; not a lot of people were aware of it and heard it then. Um, but we did two half-hour broadcasts, um, which were one for celebrating Burns Night and one celebrating Hong okay. Manet, uh, another year. And they were half an hour in length, and we thought, well, maybe we can do half-hour shows, because they would place those at 6.30 in the evening, which is the prime sort of uh, radio comedy slot. Yeah. But they said, no, they didn't want them at half an hour, and indeed didn't want any more at all. So oh. we thought we'd rather shut ourselves in the foot by asking. <laughs> no, they would have come up with a way not to do it anyway. It's... They did sometimes put them out at, at, uh, in the early evening, because when things... Uh, serious things happen like Gulf War mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, they extended the six o'clock news by a quarter of an hour every night. And so they then had, instead of the 6.30 to 7 comedy slot, they had the 6.45 to 7 comedy slot. So they'd put out Hamish and Dougal in that. So, uh, you know, in times of national crisis, they play somber music and put out Hamish and Dougal. <laughs> <laughs> that had helped take people's minds off it. That's what I thought, yes. Uh, so they're being repeated on BBC Seven at the moment. Yes, BBC Seven's fantastic. It's all these old stuff um, gets uh, churned out again, and uh, you know they reward us with almost ten p a broadcast. It's brilliant. <laughs> Getting a, a bit expensive there. Um, <laughs> and how was your time on the Doctor Who audio in two thousand and ten? Would you play the meddling monk in a TV series? Um. I love doing those Doctor Who's. They're, they're really good fun, and uh, they get some really cracking actors on too. So it's a delight to work with, um, and I, I certainly enjoyed playing the monk. I, yeah, I, I'd I'd, uh, I'd love to do it on television. Whether they're actually planning to bring the monk back on TV, I don't know, but uh, that'd be good fun to do.
Did you uh, hear any of the reviews that that story go? Well, your initial story, the Book of Kells, because we've got our fingers on the pulse of Doctor Who fandom, and right. they've said it's one of the best individual stories and you know performances to come along in years. So I was, nice. didn't know if you were aware of the rave reviews it was getting from all the nerdy Doctor Who fans like us. <laughs> No, you well, you see, I don't have my finger on that particular pulse like you do, but that's very nice to know, and that's terrific. Uh, no, um, it's been they are such fun to do. It's nice to know that, you know, that at the end of the day, something you know, good comes out that's appreciated by people. That's great. And Graham, well, as we say, we're very, very grateful to you for joining us and on our anniversary and being part of the 50th podcast, and it has been an absolute privilege and a pleasure to talk to you, and... Um, Thank you so much. Yeah, really, really appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thank you for your uh, the support. Thanks for the uh, petition you got together. Congratulations on your 50th. It's brilliant. And uh, here's to the next 50. <laughs>